Um, today we're going to see some Ruby syntax first, and then we're going to uh, use the uh, Rails scaffolding feature to build a simple interface. And we'll use some unit tests just to ensure that uh, data validates on when people enter things into our form. And then we're going to, uh, if we can make sure we have time, we'll try to write a public page to do some queries of some data. Uh, there's an awful lot of things to cover. Uh, I do encourage you to ask questions, though. Um, and uh, with that, let's can we get started looking at the Ruby programming language. Ruby is a pure object-oriented programming language. It's not a compiled language, though. It's an interpreted language. And so you're going to, uh, I'll be honest with you right up front, you're going to see uh, a little bit slower. But in terms of the kind of applications that Ruby is suited for, the speed isn't uh, any kind of an issue that I've ever seen. It's a strongly typed language, but it's also dynamically typed. And you'll see some examples of that in just a few minutes. But one of the biggest advantages to Ruby is that it's cross-platform. We have an interpreter written in C. But we can also run Ruby applications on the JVM using JRuby. And the Iron Ruby project allows us to write Ruby applications on the .NET framework. But Ruby is also designed for developer happiness. If you think about the kinds of applications that we're used to seeing with the Java programming language, for example, here's a, a hello world in Java. We have a lot of boilerplate code that we need to use, that we need as developers need to either type or generate for us to just print uh, the hello world string to the screen. And Ruby deals away with a lot of that. And you, know, you can see in the bottom of the slide that the hello world program in Ruby is just one line. Now, behind the scenes, of course, there's, there's an additional setup from the framework or the language itself doing things for you, but you as developers don't have to type the code. And when you think about the amount of Java code here in this example that you need to type just to get nothing to happen, uh, you, think it can, you can kind of extrapolate that out to what development with Ruby can be like on a larger scale. Another example of developer happiness is that since everything in Ruby is an object and is a pure object-oriented language, everything including integers has uh, methods on so you can call things like 10 times do puts hello, and you'll get that's how we do looping. And it's designed to be easy to read and low ceremony. Of course, there are lots of familiar things. Most programming languages have similarities, and Ruby is no exception to that. You have your basic math, and plus and minus and multiplication and division. You also have basic strings. And we use double quotes. We can also use single quotes. We can use the plus sign to concatenate these strings together. And we have our variables. We define a variable, and we don't have to define an explicit type. We don't have to say that something's a string or something's an age. When we assign a value to the variable, then the data type becomes locked down. So we are going to be forced to cast these things. So we use, and in this case, where we're going to put out the, we're going to put out Homer has two donuts on this slide, we're going to need to convert the number to a string so that we can add it to the rest of the strings in the sentence. If we don't do that, we'll get uh, an interpreter error and the program will halt. Of course, this is such a common pattern in you know, string concatenation, is such a common pattern that we use a shortcut in Ruby, and you'll see this shortcut used quite frequently. The uh, Ruby gives us the ability with the double quoted strings to evaluate expressions, either just printing out the value of a variable, or placing complex expressions or function calls inside of the string. We use the pound sign and the curly braces syntax to do that. And this automatically casts the result to a string for us also. And Ruby has the familiar operators that you see in most languages. We use the double equal sign for equality. And we have greater than, less than, equal to. And we have familiar flow control in the Ruby programming language. Uh, if you've seen Visual Basic, it's a little bit like that. You don't have then on the end of your statements, but you have if, you know, you have an if and an end. Uh, we don't use curly braces. We don't use semicolons. And um, we can also do things a little bit differently when things call for them. Instead of having the if statement wrap a sentence, we can use it as a predicate on the end of a statement. And so we can say, you're not old enough to drive if the age is you know, less than 16. And that can come in handy for situations where you just need something to happen under a certain condition and you don't have an else clause in your statement that you need to express. But sometimes things can be very different in Ruby. 
if you ever have the need to do if not, there's a keyword in Ruby called unless that performs the same feature. And it can also be used as a predicate on the end of a statement. So you can say redirect to the home page unless the current user is an admin. And there's a little bit of an advantage to that is that the way I say that is you know, the way you would express that in, in your language. It's the way you express it when you write the code. Ruby developers tend to use arrays and hashes a lot. So we'll use uh, arrays, which is the first example, and just a comma separated list of objects. We also use hashes or dictionaries, uh, key, you know, key value pairs. So in this, in this example, you have an age and a first name and a last name. And we have that character there. It's an equal sign and a uh, greater than sign. And what you're looking at there is what we call a hash rocket in Ruby. And so whenever you see that in Ruby, you're working with a hash. And I bring that up because we tend to use hashes a lot for parameters that we send to our methods. One thing that you might also see are these, they look like variables and they start with a colon. And those are called symbols. Symbols are just labels in Ruby. Since everything is an object in the Ruby programming language, then when we create a new string, then we're actually creating a new object and taking up memory. Symbols can be used in places of strings where we need to label things, and we can conserve memory that way. So we use them a lot of times for lookup keys and hash tables and things like that. In Ruby, we also have methods, and we define methods. They're like, our, they're like functions in JavaScript or other languages. We define them with the def keyword, and then we list the parameters. And again, because those, the parameters, uh, Ruby is, you know, is a dynamically typed language, uh, we, we don't have to specify the data types of our input parameters for this method. We also don't specify the return value, because the return value in, of a method in Ruby is the value of the last executed statement by default. And so in this particular case, this method is just going to return a string of hello, first name, and last name. We also define classes a lot in Ruby. Since Ruby is an object-oriented programming language, then the programs that we write with Ruby are going to be object-oriented as well. And we can define classes the long way on the left, which we've got a pretty simple pattern, pretty common pattern in programming. We have a couple of instance variables at the top there. And we know they're instance variables in Ruby because they have at signs in front of them. So whenever you see the single at sign in front of a variable, you know that you're working with an instance variable. So we have the instance variables there, and then we have getter and setter methods to give our users access to the values stored in the instance variables. We don't have the ability to create public instance variables in Ruby. We, they're, they're private by default, so we need to use getters and setters for that. But this common pattern uh, can be replaced by three lines on the right. That one line, attribute accessor, there, creates the instance variables, the getters, and the setters. And then we could override whatever ones we didn't, whichever ones we needed to override for later purposes. If we needed our first name and last name setters to be a little bit more complex, we could override those. But uh, to make it clear, these two uh, pieces of code are exactly, they perform exactly the same functions. We create new instances of our classes with the new method. So in this particular case, we have our person class. We'll use person.new, and that'll create our new instance. And once we've created the new instance, we can call our methods on it. Then we can say homer.firstName equals homer. And in that is, that looks a little bit like almost setting up property. So it just turns out that a convention in Ruby is to have our setter methods have an equal sign as part of the method name. And this leads us to a topic in Ruby called semantic sugar. We can use setter and getter methods, as we're used to using in our programming languages, but we can use the equal sign as part of the method name on the setters, and we can put a space in front of them, or choose not to. Ruby doesn't care. It will remove the space from the method name if we were to put it in there. And that allows us to make a little bit more readable code. Look at the first example, homer.firstName equals homer without the space, and then you can do the same thing with the space. So the equal sign is actually part of the method name and not just uh, an assignment operator. 